Hi everybody, welcome back. Um, we're gonna continue on with our Bio2 lecture today and we're gonna be talking now and moving into animals. So hopefully this is exciting for us as we go. So here we have our typical cladogram of all the different animal groups that we will cover. And um, you can kind of see if you remember your geological time scale, which you need to remember as we continue throughout the class. Um, but these correspond to different geological events in that time scale. So we're seeing that the animals arise as animals, the metazoan group here, around 770 million years ago, and then break apart uh, from there. So we're going to go through these and talk about our various groups. So first of all, what is an animal? And um, this should be kind of obvious to you maybe, but uh, let's just make sure we have our definition of our cladogram of the characteristics that are going to fit with each clade, just like we did with, say, the um, eukarya, when, the, when we did the different supergroups of eukarya, there are certain characteristics that make all those in one supergroup or another. And we have that with every group of organisms we do. Animals are no different. So by definition, animals are multicellular. They are eukaryotic and they are heterotrophic, which you already know when we talked about bacteria, because some bacteria are heterotrophic. That means they get both their carbon and their energy source from organic molecules like eating other things. They have cell membranes, but they lack cell walls. Um, so all living things have a cell membrane, but not everything has a cell wall and animals do not have a cell wall. The cells are held together by structural proteins called collagen. And we'll talk about some of these. They contain not in every case, but in nearly all nervous tissue and muscle tissue. And most of them reproduce using sexual reproduction and they have a dominant diploid stage. Um, I've mentioned this when we were talking about the alternation of generations. Um, animals do not really have an alternation of generation in the same sense as we talked about, say, the mosses, because the haploid uh, version of the organism is uh, one cell, a sperm and an egg. Whereas in something like a moss, there's a whole plant-like thing where all the cells are haploid and are one in. Um, these are all two in, two sets, okay? Now, there's a couple of characteristics that um, will allow us to distinguish different groups of animals as we go. So one of the first things we'll talk about is development. And so when a sperm fertilizes an egg, that resulting first diploid cell uh, is called a zygote. That zygote then goes through mitosis and therefore you have one cell and that cell divides and becomes two cells. And that keeps going on and what ends up happening as that one cell goes through mitosis and then those two cells go through mitosis, you end up with different distinctive stages um, that that zygote turns into. So when we go from a zygote, one cell, go through several different mitotic divisions, you end up with this solid ball of cells. I think they usually do it around eight to 16 or something like that. Um, but there's a point at which the cells divide that you end up with a solid ball of several cells and that stage is called the marula that continues on going through mitosis and eventually as it gets bigger uh, the cells keep dividing and there are more of them um, and you end up with a stage where there's a hollow space uh, in the middle and that stage is called the blastula and, and I'll go back to this in a second uh, but if you continue on from the blast, you keep dividing, you have that hollow ball of cells. And if you imagine if you had a balloon and you took a balloon and you used your thumbs and you pushed into the balloon with your thumbs, what you would see is if this is your balloon and you're pushing your thumbs up in here, you end up with this sort of indentation and that's called 
the gastrula stage. And then several things can happen uh, from there as you push in like that. Um, that opening that you created is called the blastopore. And that space inside there, like, so, so where you first push your thumbs in is the blastula. And the deeper you go, your fingernails then end up deeper into that balloon, if you will. That space is called the archenteron. And at that stage, usually you have two very distinctive sort of layers, one that's on the outside. And now that's one that's sort of pushed into the inside. And those are gonna end up being on the outside, my ectoderm tissue and my endoderm tissue. These are very early primary sort of um, developmental tissue stages that can become the other things. You'll notice that in this picture that this zygote is a certain size. And then if you look at this uh, marula and then the blastula as we go this way, the size at this point is staying about the same, but the cells are getting smaller. So the uh, organism at this point is dividing and there are more cells, but but it isn't really growing size wise yet. Okay. Now that we have that, um, it, we can take that then that early sort of stage of development, uh, which will come in down here and talk about how that plays in. But the different animal groups then are defined and based on um, several different sort of characteristics. One is the organization level, um, body symmetry, body cavity, development and segmentation. And I'm going to walk you through each one of those as we go. So we'll start first with organization level. Um, early on, one of the, the, the very first group or most primitive group in the fossil record um, and genetically of organisms are the sponges. And those are in the phylum periphera. And they have a cellular level of organization. They're basically, uh, they're multicellular, but the cells don't work in a very cooperative sort of way. They're more like a group of cells that are all together and each one sort of um, does its own part. They don't sort of rely on each other. After you pass through sponges um, and we go on, all the other groups we'll see have a tissue level of organization and function as tissues, okay? And uh, we're gonna talk about this in a minute when we get to tissues, but a tissue is a group of cells that perform a particular function and they are separated by a membrane, okay? The next, is symmetry, how symmetrical it is. And kind of just like when we did the monocots and dicots, there are some nice general rules that allow us to separate monocot plants and dicot plants. Um, and if you take the concept of the number of, say, petals in the flower, three versus four or five, most of them are that way, but there's a couple exceptions here and there. And that's true also with animals when we talk about symmetry and, all, and, and these types of things. But it allows us to sort of get a good gauge on where we're starting, okay? So there are two kinds of symmetry we'll talk about. We'll talk about radial symmetry and we'll talk about bilateral symmetry. Radial symmetry is something that's sort of round-like and uh, the, the Nidereans, which are things like sea jellies or jellyfish, which is not a very good word to use because of the fish in it, um, but sea jellies and another group that's like those that you may not know about, what we'll talk about are tenophores. They are radially symmetrical, which means that you can, if you were to take the organism and, and cut it in half one way, you could turn your cut and cut it another way and your right and your left would still be about the same, right? So it doesn't matter which sort of direction you cut this or in this flower pot kind of thing. You can cut it multiple ways in radial symmetry where you end up with a right and with a left. Other things are bilaterally symmetrical like us. And in things that are bilaterally symmetrical, you have a clear right side and a left side. And you can't really cut the organism in a different plane and get a right or left you get a front or back or you get something else. So if you take the crayfish here, you can see you can cut it down the middle like that and you have a right and a left, they sort of mirror each other. But if you were to go like that, 
you don't have a right or left. You have like a, a right front and a left back or that kind of thing. Okay. The other thing that we can uh, look at, and this will be significant. We'll talk about this a lot because it's not only significant in terms of distinguishing what group an organism goes into, but it has some implications on development and size and physiology of the organism. Um, but if we talk about that uh, developmental stage we were talking about before, where you have your gastula stage, where you have your thumbs pushing in like that, um, this inside part in here can end up becoming different things. If it ends up being solid and there's solid mesoderm tissue in the middle, the red, um, that ends up be call, being called what we call an aceliomate. Okay. So aceliomate, and sometimes you'll see this spelled as euceliomate, meaning true. Uh, acelome is a body cavity. It's a, it's a space. And the space allows you to grow organs inside and the organs can grow and shrink and, and change shape because there's room in there. In an animal such as a platyhelminthes worm, a flatworm, there's solid mesoderm tissue there. So the organism is sort of fixed on body size. It can't, once it's, once it's developed, it can't grow um, larger organs in this space because the space is gone. It's solid mesoderm. There's no body cavity. Okay. Now in other animals, which we'll talk about, most other animals are going to have some kind of space in there. And depending on how that space develops, uh, we're going to call that um, either a pseudosalomate or a eucelomate or a salomate. And so there's a couple of different pseudosalomates one of the biggest and most successful groups of all are the nematode worms. And if you look, both of these have this space in here. You can see there's a space in there and there's a space in there. And the difference is in a true coelom, the space is completely surrounded by mesoderm on all sides. This space here is not, okay? It's not surrounded by mesoderm on all sides. It's surrounded on the interior, but you notice that the space comes into direct contact with the endoderm tissue. So it's not separated like this one is here. Um, but both a pseudosalomate and a eucelomate animal have this body cavity or space, and it allows things like reproductive organs to grow larger at certain times of the year. Um, it allows your stomach to expand, for example, into that space if you eat too much food. So there's some flexibility in what can happen in a body cavity in an organism that has one. And um, in general, organisms that are acelomates tend to be fairly small in size. That You don't see very many um, in fact, I can't think of any that are significantly large, but aceliomate organisms are sort of constricted on body size because they, they lack the surface area to grow organs and, and regulate um, nutrient flow and all kinds of things of that sort. Okay. Now, if we're talking about um, coeloms and how that coelom develops, and we're talking about eucelomates, so these are all eucelomates here. There are there are two different sort of pathways that that can develop, and we call those protosomes and deuterostomes. So, if you look um, early on here, you, you remember we talked about uh, if, if you get rid of the red right now and just think about this uh, um, blastula, not blastula, the gastrula. If you think about the gastrula stage here, where you have your balloon and you're pushing into the balloon and you ignore the red right now. So here's your thumbs pushing into a balloon. Um, as that continues to grow, what's going to happen is eventually that pushing through is going to go all the way through to the other side. And 
And it's kind of, you got to imagine, it's almost like a donut then at that point, because you're going to go all the way through, come out the other side, but it's still connected. It's so, so imagine it's not flat, but rather it's round. So what you're doing is you push your thumbs through, you end up making a tube that runs from one end to the other, to the animal in, during development. And then what, what ends up happening, and it depends on the way that the organism develops it, but the organs and the muscles and, and many of the, the um, organs in the animal will develop from this next layer of tissue called mesoderm. And that mesoderm can come out and develop in two very different ways. One is it can form at the base here is these solid pieces of mesoderm and then they split and end up having a space inside, kind of like how we had the blastula growing with cells and then there was a hollow space in the inside. That's called schizocelous development because of the split. And that happens in protostomes, which I'll get to in a second. In deuterostomes, what happens is at the top, so not at the base here, but rather at the top where the um, endoderm is pushing through, you'll see this development of these little pockets. They're like little ears almost right there. And those little ear-like things are going to make little pockets, and then they're going to pinch off um, and, and the result is sort of the same in that when you're done, you've made a tube go through and you end up with these mesoderm little bags um, that, that go around the whole organism. So remember, this is cut in this case in half. But again, it's like a imagine like a donut. And if you had a donut and you pushed um, before you had a donut, and you had one big piece of bread like thing and you pushed your fingers through to make the donut. Um, this is one opening of the donut. This is the other. Inside the donut are these sacks and they go around the whole thing. So the result looks the same at this point for a protostome and deuterostome. But one big difference is in the protostome, not only does the mesoderm develop differently, but that very first opening when you pushed through becomes in all these organisms, the mouth. So a protostome, the blastopore, so they call this the fate of the blastopore, uh, and what that means is, what's the blastopore become? In this case, the blastopore becomes the mouth in protostomes. In deuterostomes, which is us, by the way, the first opening, that very first opening, so, the first hole in animal development of things that are deuterostomes, including humans, is the anus. So it's the, it's the opposite. So in a protostome, the first opening becomes the mouth, the second opening becomes the anus, and then that develops in a way where you can eat food on this end and it goes through like that, and that's a protostome. In animals like us, which are deuterostomes, the first opening we get, that first um, opening there in deuterostomes, that first opening becomes the anus, and your second opening then becomes your mouth. So it's sort of reversed. And there isn't really like any huge functional difference, I don't think, um, but, but development is a critical thing in, in trying to figure out how things are related developmental changes early on have big results later on in terms of what the organism uh, looks like and becomes. So in terms of trying to understand how things are related, development is a very useful tool. Now, I should also add one more thing that um, as the protostomes and deuterostomes develop, the, the way the cells divide is a little different. In protostomes, they, they sort of spiral, they turn, and they are determinate. And in, and that's in protostomes. Not sure if I said that correctly or not. In deuterostomes, uh, they are radial, so they kind of they don't turn, and they are indeterminate. Now, what that means is, in a nutshell, that these 
once they divide and become a certain kind of cell, they can't really become any other kind of cell. So they're, they're not stem cell cells like ours are. Um, in, in, in deuterostomes, they're radial and they're indeterminate, which means that like if you lost this cell, for example, this one could end up replacing its spot later on. That's probably not enough cells there to probably say that correctly, but, but in general, that's what that idea means of indeterminate. Okay. So, um, this is basically the wording of the exact same thing I said. So the difference between protostomes and deuterostomes, uh, spiral versus determinate cleavage and schizocelous development versus we call that interocelous development. So the little pockets where if this is growing like that, these little pockets here, uh, some people say they look like little Mickey Mouse ears. Um, that's interocelous development. And then again, the fate of the blastopore, what does the blastopore become? The first opening uh, in a protostome, proto means first stone, mouth, protostomes, the first opening becomes the mouth. In deuterostomes, second, I think deutero means second or somewhere along the lines like that. Uh, sometimes they use uh, Greek, which throws me off. So Latin um, tends to be very um, consistent and you learn a lot of Latin words and then they can help you. But but the Greek words are close um, and, and often those don't, um, I, I don't remember those as well. Anyway, the deuterostome, that second opening becomes the mouth. Okay. Um, and, and if we look at the different kinds of organisms we have in those groups, we'll find our protostome organisms are going to be things like our mollusks, which are clams, snails, squid, octopods, and so forth. Uh, annelid worms, earthworms, things of that sort. Arthropods, the biggest group of things that have been identified, uh, crustaceans, insects, and then deuterostomes. There, there's really not a huge amount of deuterostomes, uh, but they include the echinodermata and the chordata, which ends up being, uh, we're in the chordata. Echinoderms are things like sea stars um, and a couple other things like that. So we'll talk about that as we go on. The other thing we can talk about uh, or that we use in um, classifying organisms is segmentation. Are they segmented? Do they have repeated body segments or not? So what we find is that things like the mollusca are soft and unsegmented bodies. The annelids are soft uh, bodied and segmented. Um, and then we have uh, arthropods, which have a hard body and are segmented. And then we have the chordata, which are things like us. And they, it's, you know, are they hard or are they soft? They have a, they, they, they're soft on the outside, but they have an internal skeleton, which we'll talk about in, in, in most of them. And they have a segmented body as well. Um, in terms of tissues, uh, we're mostly going to do this in lab, but I want to point this out now and tell you a couple things about it. Tissues are a group of cells that, again, have some common structure and function, and they're separated by membranes. And in animals, we have four basic kinds of tissue. They are epithelial tissue, connective tissue, nervous tissue, and muscle tissue. And in lab, we'll have a whole bunch of examples of these, and you'll learn you know, 25 different kinds of tissues or something like that. That's a bit of an exaggeration, but it's not that far off. Um, this is bio two, so you end up, you know, learning a lot of stuff. But anyway, epithelial tissue are tissues that line the surface of things. Depends on what it is. So, for example, your skin on the outside of your body that is a type of epithelial tissue. Um, when you eat food, it goes through your digestive tract and it goes down your esophagus into your stomach and so forth. The, the, the tube that runs through your body, when we were talking about protostomes and deuterostomes just a minute ago, that tube really is also a surface that is open to um, the, it's, it's open to the outside world. When you take a uh, aspirin, for example, you think of that as inside your body, but it kind of isn't until you absorb it across your digestive tract. So the lining of your intestines, for example, is also epithelial tissue. Anything that lines the surface um, 
of an organ, for example, uh, on that's exposed to the elements of one form or another, epithelial tissue. I'll come back to connective tissue in a minute um, because I think once we do the other three, uh, connective tissue becomes a lot easier to sort of grasp, okay? So nervous tissue is like nervous system tissue, like neurons, um, and those are used for cell communication and, and, and usually sort of a very rapid sort of way of sending information from one part of the organism's body to another, mainly consisting of neurons, so it transmits signals. And then you have muscle tissue, and muscle tissue are, are fibers that are used for contraction, and they fall into three sort of different kinds of muscle, muscle um, smooth muscle, skeletal, and cardiac. Um, skeletal muscle is the one you go to the gym to work out uh, and, and develop. Um, you're also working your cardiac muscle when you do that, that's your heart muscle. Uh, cardiac and skeletal muscle are pretty similar to one another, uh, but obviously cardiac muscle is in your heart and it has sort of a different uh, mechanism of its uh, regulation. It has its, um, in addition to having um, neurons that control it, it also has its own sort of built-in rhythm to it. Smooth muscle uh, is found throughout your body in lots of places. And this is usually um, not under your control uh, of your uh, mind, if you will. So it controls things like pushing food through your digestive tract or controlling the size of your blood vessels, okay? So those are all kinds of muscle tissue. Now, connective tissue is, is a very big group and often it is defined simply as Connective tissue is a tissue that connects the other tissues together. And it's a very broad group and it consists usually of cells, but in addition to the cells, they're scattered through some form of extracellular matrix. There's other things uh, other than just the cells. Um, when we're talking about the other three, we're usually just talking about the cells, but this has other things surrounding the cells. So, uh, blood, cartilage, bone, fat, these are all forms of connective tissue. Okay. Uh, this little larval stage here is called the trochophore larva. We won't mention it too much right now, but, but this larval stage and whether it's present or not in some of the organisms is also, also useful for defining how we group different organisms. So we, we call this a trochophore larva and it's often cited as a example of where you should put or not put an animal on your cladogram. And then there's uh, the what we call the lophophorate phyla. The lophophore is this feeding structure that you find in a certain group of organisms. We'll talk about that later on. And we'll also talk about ecdysis. Ecdysis is the process by which an organism sheds its skin. So there are organisms like um, arthropods, insects, that have an external skeleton. And in order for them to grow, they have to get rid of that. And they go through ecdysis where they shed that and then they grow a new one. We don't do that as humans, for example, because we have an internal skeleton that grows with us uh, as we develop, okay? All right, so uh, we're gonna stop there. Next lecture, we're gonna get into our first group of animals called the periphera, which are the sponges. Hope everybody's having a good day. Talk to you later.